Hi, my name is Amber Stoutenborough, and I am the Multimedia Managing Editor for the DePaglia. This year, I will also be the host of the DePaglia's podcast, Page 29. The DePaglia is a student-run newspaper that prints 28 pages each week, covering Chicago news, as well as everything else about DePaul University. This is Page 29. Today I'm meeting with Eric Ubelacher, our editor-in-chief of the DePaglia, as well as Patrick Sloan-Turner, the online managing editor. This week, they wrote a story about Safety Act and all the misinformation around this new bill. I'm here today with Eric Ubelacher and Patrick Sloan-Turner. Hi, guys. Hi, Amber. Hey, Amber. Can you explain what the Safety Act is? So the Safety Act is, it, it includes a lot more than just what's being publicized. The, the biggest part of the Safety Act is the elimination of cash bail for certain criminal offenses. This isn't a new idea. Uh, this is something that has been kind of thrown around mainly by progressive groups, um, but even some libertarian uh, groups as well for people that don't want to hold uh, certain criminals in jail just because they can't pay bond. So that's been what's been getting the most attention from the Safety Act is the elimination of that cash bail, because that's where a lot of the rumors have started that this is, you know, some kind of purge law, that crime is now going to be legal, that all these jails are going to be setting criminals free, which based on the sources that uh, I talked to are just completely untrue for the most part. But that's that's the crux of what you've been hearing about the Safety Act. And like Eric said, it, it's not a new idea, but um, last year it was passed and it is the first bill of its kind that's actually been passed. And I think that alone, just its freshness and newness kind of feeds into the fire a little bit with the rhetoric that's been coming with it. I was going to say, I feel like I've heard so much misinformation, but also like just in the city, we have like City Wire and other places that are just telling misinformation. Well, it's it's made worldwide news as kind of the purge law. I've been reading stories from all over the world talking about the significance of this when in reality, you know, we don't know what it's going to look like when the law takes effect on January 1st, 2023. But I think a lot of the misinformation is it, it stems from the fact for, for a couple of reasons, actually. Um, Illinois is the first state that is trying this getting rid of cash bail. No other state has done it before. It's like I said, kind of been popular in progressive circles. Illinois is not the most progressive state. Uh, outside of Chicago, it's, it's a very red state. So it's very polarized. We have a lot of kind of centrist democratic history in Chicago government as well. I, I think a reason why people are so prone to misinformation about it is because of Chicago's reputation as a violent city, Chicago's reputation as a city with a lot of people in these prisons. So, you know, anytime you have a law this new passed, especially in a city where the issue of crime is as polarizing as Chicago, people are going to be very susceptible to misinformation from the right, which the right has a very big presence outside of Chicago and Illinois as well. So I think that that's been the biggest reason for misinformation. I also think uh, timing plays an issue here. You know, we have an election coming up and fear can be a powerful tool to get people on your side and to listen to what you have to say. So. I think it was kind of a perfect storm of the timing and, you know, using Chicago's reputation, like Eric said, um, just to kind of push this message and wield it for political use, I guess. Okay. Did you talk to anyone that was really supportive of the Safety Act? So I, I did not talk to anyone that was like unequivocally in support of this act. I talked to three sources that acknowledged that it had positive, it had some positive benefits to it. And all of them agreed that it was a step in the right direction. Kareem Butler, for example, he's a uh, pretrial justice fellow at Chicago Appleseed, which is an organization that's centered on achieving quality within the criminal justice system. Uh, obviously, somebody like him, he was very much in support of abolishing cash bail like this, because contrary to what you may be reading from a lot of the misinformation about the Safety Act, abolishing cash bail does not put people that, quote, should be in jail out on the streets. Everyone that is eligible for cash bail, uh, if they had the money, they would be back. They would get their freedom anyway. So every source that I talked to acknowledged that this was a positive step in kind of limiting the class disparities, the racial disparities in Chicago or all of Illinois' criminal justice system because it gets rid of that, that barrier. You know, if you're arrested for a crime and bail is set at $10,000, you can't pay the $10,000, you remain in jail. Obviously, you know, when you say it like that, just thinking about it, 
you can see why that would cause disparities in the criminal justice system because wealthy people can commit crimes, pay bail, get their freedom. That's not the case for many people in Illinois. So in terms of getting rid of that class disparity in the criminal justice system, everyone that I talked to acknowledged that that was certainly the case. Uh, uh, Demetrius Jordan, um, the DePaul professor that I talked to, he again acknowledged the positives that could have and kind of limiting inequities in the justice system. But he even floated the idea that this might not even be the reason for the bill to pass in the first place. Chicago in particular, but all Illinois jails tend to be on the fuller side that costs the state a lot of money. So if you have all these people that can't pay their bail anyway, if you're not giving the state money to pay your bail, you're actually costing the state money by remaining in prison. Um, so he thinks that that was probably a pretty significant reason behind this part of the safety act, getting rid of cash bail is because it costs the state so much money as well. So, you know, people on the right, you should look at this and be like, well, that's a good thing. We're saving the state money. So it, that's the thing. It's, it doesn't fall neatly along party lines, but. Um, I think like a big part of the messaging that's been pushed by the right, the misinformation really is that, you know, cops are going to be powerless to arresting people now, or, you know, judges won't have any discretion or ability, I should say, to um, keep offenders pre-trial. But that's just like categorically untrue. Um, like any cop that feels that an offender is danger to public safety can still arrest them on their own discretion. And any court in Illinois can still make that same determination. Do you guys have anything else that you think is important for the listeners to hear? I think that it's important not to read really anything and have some kind of knee jerk reaction of like, oh, this is what's going to happen. Like Eric said, in reality, we, we don't really know what this is going to look like. I think that like it's not going to be in some crazy extreme thing in, in either way. You know, the water is going to find its level. And um, I think it's just a piece of criminal justice reform that, you know, Illinois started first and, and is going to spread elsewhere. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Amber. Thanks, Amber. I'm here today with our news editor, Kirsten Reedford, on her story about Danny Cruz. Hi, Kirsten. Hi. So can you tell us who is Danny Cruz? Danny Cruz is the head custodian for the Schmidt Academic Center. Um, he not only is a custodian that's been there for 28 years now, um, but he also is in charge of a lot of different areas um, over his time. He's been a custodian in like the alumni hall and like other areas of the school. He also works in like the library and stuff like that. But I think there's a lot more to Danny than what we kind of noticed. And like something that I kind of like added in the story too is how Danny works in a food pantry outside of working at DePaul. He is really tied to his like Vincentian values. So he really notes that in order for him to like feel whole as a person, he has to live, breathe, and be like the Vincentian message. So like he saw service is just something that's like really big. So yeah, that's basically who Danny is. Where did you find the inspiration to write this story? Basically, Newsline came out with their solidified 125 faces of Paul website, and then they linked it, and I was like, wow. Super cool. I'm going to look at this. And then I saw Danny's face all like lit up and big. And I was like, no way. Because last year when I would walk around and distribute the papers for the Depalia every week, I would um, always see him when I was carrying like three or four stacks of the paper. He'd always be like, oh my gosh, you're so strong. Because I'm carrying like four <laughs> stacks of paper like, through the stack. Like one time he even said like... <laughs> He said, um, if you were fighting a bear, I wouldn't want to be the bear. I'd be on your <laughs> side. <I'm> like, <laughs> you see, you mentioned 125 faces. Can you explain what that is? The 125 faces of DePaul project was basically, it wasn't really like much of an initiative. It's more just like this year is the 125th anniversary of DePaul's existence. Um, it's just like a really like pivotal moment. Um, for instance, like the logo from this year was chosen by, um, it was, like, chosen by, like, the university leaders to represent, like, for the 125th anniversary, and the art was done by um, a student that's a senior this year, and, like, stuff like that. So they're really just going all out this year, but they wanted to choose 125 people at DePaul that they think represents the Vincentian message, like, the mission as a whole, and just, like, what really makes DePaul, like, what it is. So... 
the people that were chosen were nominated by different people in the DePaul community. So yeah, it's just a collection of a bunch of people that they think represents what DePaul really is. And who chose that? For what I was reading, they had 145 nominations. And then basically, they went by like, whoever was chosen the most amount of times okay, by got point. picked. Yeah, so it was like the top 125 people. That's really cool. And Danny Cruz was one of them. Yep. So when you look at the website, the people that have the bigger circle, like profiles, ha- are like the people that have the most amount of votes. And Danny's was the biggest circle. Oh, that's, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, that's really cute that he like everyone picked him. How did it go? Like talking to him about this, like what did he say when you asked to interview him for this story? You know, it was interesting because I had to go through his boss first to make sure he could actually do it. When we actually like got to like sit down with him and everything, he was like, he's really nervous. It was kind of cute. Um, but he was, he kept reemphasizing like that he doesn't feel like he's worthy of it. Mm. Yeah. Like he, he said like, this is, this is my job. This is what I'm doing. I'm like doing this for the kids. I'm doing this for like everyone that's here. I'm not doing this for accolades and awards and everything else. Like I'm just doing this to like, to get the paycheck, to be able to get like, the education that my wife and my kids need and just like <laughs> you know like he's just doing it to like make sure that his like family has a good life and out of it because of his personality and like bubbliness and like willingness to like, talk and be with people he's gotten so much more from it so i think that's really cool but yeah it's amazing so was it like a in-person interview when you did this yeah basically i just met me and aaron hens our assistant photo editor we all met in the sack and we met there and he was like, so I don't, I don't know what to do. Do you like, what do you want me to do? And Aaron's like, oh, just stand right there and holds the camera. And he's like, I don't know what I'm doing. He's like talking mid photo. It was kind of funny. But Aww. basically after that, he just walked us around the school and showed us a bunch of different stuff that he does. And I think something that's really cool is he showed us like all the small like aspects of it. Every time we're in a classroom, we have to make sure the podium is in the center of the room. We have to make sure all the chairs are like back to where they should be because it kind of looks chaotic after a whole class gets done. And like the whiteboard needs to be wiped down, stuff like that. I think some of the things I did kind of already know about the facility, but that's also because I've been made really aware of a lot of things in school. (laughs) That's kind of just what comes with my job. But I think something that was super important that he pointed out was, like, he was just really, like, emphasizing how everything in the building goes towards helping the students that go to the school. He was, like, my kids, my family, like, this school, like, everyone that's here is, like, my family. And the stuff that I'm doing is making sure that I'm helping take care of them and keep them safe. I was, like... Dang. Sounds like he really deserves that 125 face. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I, I mean, like, I would argue so. It's interesting how he doesn't think so, but I think I would argue that he does. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. And next we have Una Cleary, our focus editor for the DePaulia. This week she wrote about banned books. Hi, Luna. Hi, Hi, Amber. So can you tell me about what your story was this week? Yeah, so I wrote about uh, Banned Books Week 2022, kind of just all about what Banned Books Week is, the history of it, the controversy around it, and a lot about the polarization of it in our country, um, how it's become quite a political thing. It's really cool. Is this like nationwide that it's just a full week of banned books, like a whole discussion on it? Yeah, it is. Um, The American Library Association started it, and they started it to talk about Banned books, just like why it's important that we have it. So, so why is it important for this? Yeah. So, like what I was saying, um, a lot of what the conversation around it has been, it's been around censorship in our country, and that has a lot to do with the First Amendment, our First Amendment rights as Americans, and that is our right. And banning information for anyone is something that is going to become like an argument. <laughs> for a lot of different people, um, even the organizations that are banning it are using American ideals to kind of argue against it. Um, Interesting. And so I think it's like just kind of funny how it's almost like the same reasons for arguing it, but they're kind of using it in different ways. 
that's an interesting perspective mm-hmm. to think that it's just it's the same argument. They're just like angry at each other for it. Yeah, basically. I mean, it's it's all about censorship and um, just taking away information from people. And a lot of the people I interviewed just talk about why that's so crucial um, that we have this information. So you said that City Lit came in to discuss with DePaul about banned books. Can you explain like what they are and what the event was? Yeah, so City Lit Theater is a Chicago um, theater company. And for, I'm pretty sure, 15 years now, they've been doing live readings of banned books. Like, so whatever the previous year's banned books were, um, they come into different libraries around Chicago and they will read excerpts from different books. And so they came to DePaul this year and did that. It was super fun. It was a full room, just a lot of students, some professors. And yeah, it was just super fun to hear um, some of the readings. The excerpts they're reading is reasons why the books are banned. Um, okay. And some of the books, like, it, it's just funny what they're reading. The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian um, was about these the main character and his new friend at his new school. And the kid is explaining to him that reading books will give you a boner. And the kid was saying that it will give you like a literal boner, not an actual boner. And he's like, yes, I'm, I'm getting a boner from this. And so they were like acting it out. And it was just super funny to hear, especially when you when you see it acted out and you're like, oh, this is the reason that the book was banned. It's just super comical, I think. Comical and almost like, oh, this is it. Yeah, this is the reason. Like, it's, I mean, if anything I learned from this, from writing this article is that books will be banned for, I mean, really any reason at all. A lot of the times when books are banned, they're banned because they may have one instance of talking about mental illness or talking about um, someone kissing or something like that. So, I mean, they're being banned for absolutely anything and everything i mean it's yeah it's crazy interesting yeah so in your article you talked to a lot of different people can you kind of explain like what they were talking about i quoted um the english chair michelle morano and she had a lot of interesting things to say she just asked like why is this threatening why is learning about race and lgbtq rights why is that threatening and i think that's a question a lot of people are asking like I mean, it shouldn't it shouldn't be anything that's threatening. Knowledge is not threatening and it's being perceived as such just like learning about these things are these groups that are banning these books, they they think that it's threatening because of a lot of different reasons. One of these reasons is because they think that reading these books will turn their children gay. I mean, obviously it just doesn't make any sense and <laughs> it's bold. <laughs> I mean, it's It's not surprising that this is happening right now with everything else going on. And that's why the amount of books are being banned right now is just because of, I think, everything else happening in our our country in these past couple of years. And I think it's definitely in direct relation to just the absolute polarization of politics in our country. Yeah, I was going to say that's one of the big pieces that you talk about in your article is about polarization. (laughs) You know, like you said, it's a huge topic right now. And I just find it so interesting that it's about like children's books. Exactly. Like not even just books in general, but like that people are so concerned about what their children are reading that they're willing to ban it for everyone. Yeah. Um, Do you want to go more in depth with that? Even, I mean, I read a couple of these organizations' websites and I read some of their mission statements. um, And it is, it's just, I mean, I'm not surprised that (laughs) this is happening um, and that it's happening in like such an amount in these past couple of years. But it's just completely like the way that they talk about it, they, they say that they're bringing like liberty and they're bringing American values back into schools. But that just it's the complete opposite of what they're doing. I mean, they're they're censoring information. That's not what our country is supposed to represent. And it's sad because they're children. And if you're grown up in these communities and that's all you're learning about, you can't learn about these things. It's just a cycle. It's just going to keep going on and on, I think. Um, So I think it's really important to keep talking about it. And I think that's why it's it's super cool that we have a banned books week. 
Um, I think it's great that DePaul had it. And so it's great that DePaul had it, but I think we need to make sure that these type of things are happening all over the country, happening in places where, you know, it's not as liberal. Um, Yeah. So obviously they have like a top 10 banned books. Mm -hmm. Did any that like you've read in your childhood? Yeah. Um, I read The Hate You Give and The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian is about um, a kid growing up on a reservation in Spokane, Washington. I grew up in Washington and I didn't grow up in Spokane, but I mean, reading that and um, reading how education is there in our country, I read it freshman year of high school. The author came in and spoke to us because he's from Washington. And it was just like one of the coolest books I've read. You know, it's again, it's nothing harmful. It's just knowledge. <laughs> like That's what it is. It's learning about a perspective that's different from your own. And it's opening your mind, even in a place like Spokane is a four hour drive from where I lived and like learning about that growing up Seattle's super liberal so growing up there and learning about a place four hours away where they don't have education like that they don't have all of these things um it was it was really just like really opened my mind the same thing with the hate you give learning about police brutality it's just knowledge that's all it is (laughs) and and it doesn't I mean, it opens your mind. It may change your opinions, but it's not going to change, like, who you are as a person. But I don't know. It it was surprising, for sure. And I think it's sad that, like, some people just can't read these books. Because, it. I mean, those two books definitely opened my mind, like, early on in high school and made me interested in things that I'm now interested in. And some people haven't read those books or don't even just don't have the option to read it um another thing that chief of the english department said michelle moreno it doesn't matter if you don't like the book it's it's your opinion to not like the book but it's the fact that you don't have the option to read the book um because taste is subjective but if you don't even have the option to to read something it's insane (laughs) Well, this is a this is a really interesting topic. I'm glad you got to cover it this week and make it your focus piece as well. It's, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say? Um, yeah. Look at the American Library Association's top ten most challenged books. I think everyone should read them. Um, just keep reading books. All right. Thank you so much, Una. Thank you. <laughs> You can read all of these stories and more at the Polio Online or picking up one of our print newspapers this week. My name is Amber Stoutenborough, and this is Page 29. Thank you so much for listening.